My cousin recently reminded me of a memory I had suppressed because it was one of the most ter terrifying moments of my childhood. I'm from Texas, so we hardly ever get snow days, so when we did, I always tried to take advantage. When I was in 6th grade, my school was shut down for two snow days. This never happened. It was a miracle. On one of the days, my cousin came over and we decided to walk to my old elementary school to go play at the park. It was about four blocks away from my house. I lived in the neighborhood for years, so I knew someone on almost every block. This is important for later. I always felt safe and I knew the neighborhood, so walking to the park with my cousin was no big deal. We got to the park and surprisingly, we were the only two people there. We were having a blast. We moved from the playground to the field behind the playground. To kind of explain the layout, we entered the playground from the back parking lot, so we had to walk through the parking lot or the field next to it to get to the playground. There is a dumpster in the parking lot that was against a brick wall. There is a space between the wall and the dumpster that a lot of teenagers used to hang out behind. On the other side of the wall was the playground, and a few yards to the left of the dumpster was a large field. So, we're enjoying our time when this truck pulled up. There were two men in it. I got a really bad feeling. I told my cousin that we should probably head home. My cousin insisted that it was nothing, so I shook it off and I kept playing in the snow. The men got out of the truck and went behind the dumpster. My cousin reassured me that it was not a big deal because, like I said, a lot of people went back there. And that's when they started yelling, saying things like, Woo, this is gonna be fun. Even at age 11, I was paranoid. Come on, let's go home, please, she said. And they're not even talking to us, just ignore them. I was in 7th grade, so I listened to her. Until we heard them scream. What are you girls doing here all alone? Where are your parents? You're here all by yourself. Chills ran down my spine. I was so scared. My cousin and I looked at each other and automatically started walking really fast through the field to head home. The men came out from behind the dumpster and started yelling. Where are you girls going? We just want to talk to y'all. We were terrified. Our fast walk turned into a sprint. We got to the sidewalk and that's when we heard the truck door slam. My heart sank and I started crying. They peeled out of the parking lot. All I could think is we were about to get taken. The truck was making its way towards us. Knowing someone on almost every block ended up saving mine and my cousin's life. I had a friend that lived across the street from the school. All we had to do was cut across this small neighborhood intersection and we would be there. The truck caught up to us as soon as we had crossed the intersection. They slowed down and the man on the passenger side rolled his window down. Why are you girls running? We just want to have some fun with y'all. The truck came to a stop but we had made it. We ran up to the door and started yelling for help and ringing the doorbell. The truck sped off. We were safe, and we told my friend and her parents what had happened, and my mom came and picked us up. We were so scared, we couldn't even remember any details about the truck or the men. All I knew was I would never go to that park alone again. If I didn't think to run to my friend's house, I don't know if I would be here. If the men had caught up to us before crossing the intersection, I don't even want to imagine what would have happened. I don't know what the two men were planning on doing to us, but I know that it wasn't good. So, to the two men that ruined my snow day and scared me shitless, let's not meet. One day when I was about 14 years old, I'm 22 now, I was home alone during the summer watching my two younger sisters. At the time, they were 8 and 5, while my parents were at work. Now usually this was a normal thing for me. It was all routine my parents would leave money, about 20 bucks, just enough for pizza if we were hungry. They would come back from work around 5 or 6. This particular day didn't sit well with me because, for one, I was feeling really sick and two, I absolutely hated the rain. The rain was terrible this day. 
and this was still a time where my sisters were still scared of thunder and lightning. It was really gloomy outside, and I would like to think the creepy part of my day started around noon from what I remember. I was in my dad's room when I heard a loud knock on the front door. Now, we have a TV in the room over where my sister was watching her favorite show at the time. Rugrats, it's completely irrelevant, but I like the show too. Now, something didn't feel right other than me being so sick and not being able to keep anything down. I quickly popped up off the couch and peeked outside through the window in my dad's room, which looked straight onto the driveway. I look in, I see this green truck parked in my driveway, and I quickly thought, nobody in my family has a green truck, and why would somebody be visiting in this horrible weather? So, quickly and quietly, I make my way to my sister's room, and tell her to help me make sure all the windows are locked in the house. While I was in school, I didn't believe in spare keys, so I would hop through all the windows of my home to get in. Now she's pretty freaked out because she had no idea what was going on. After locking all the windows of the house, I told her to grab my youngest sister and wait in the bathroom, and lock the door and to not come out until she heard my voice telling her to do so. I looked out the peephole and I see two men standing at the front door. What well, looks like they're trying to pick the lock or whatever, but... I didn't know what they were doing, I was just freaking out. At this point, I'd already turned everything off to keep from making any noise. I walked quietly to the house phone, and a rookie mistake on my part, called my mother and told her my situation. She had told me to call the police, and that this should have been my first move, and that she would be on her way and would be calling my father. As soon as I hung up, I called the police and told them my situation and they told me that help would be on the way. By this time, I heard a slam like a door of the car being shut. I look outside and I see the two men had vanished. I guess, unsuccessful in their attempt to break into my home, they left upset. The police showed up about the same time my parents did, a few short moments later, and I told them what had happened. The police told me that next time to call them first in a situation like this one, and to thank God that nobody got hurt. Honestly, I was only worried about my sisters because if the two men did get in, I wouldn't have been able to take on both of them. After that day, we went on like normal except we went to my grandma's from there on out. I never saw those two men again, and I hope that we never meet. I am and have always been a very small girl. Standing at 4'11", full grown now at 27. And I've always been able to pass as being much younger than I am. Especially if I'm not wearing any makeup. When I was a small child, about 7 or 8, my father bought a little cabin in a town in Texas called Livingston. In an area of Livingston called Onalaska. I specify because of the second part of the story. Anyone with kids needs to be wary of the area. The cabin was really nothing remarkable at only 600 square feet. It was really just one giant room, a teeny kitchen the size of a normal bathroom, and a bathroom the size of a large closet, and a porch out front. The whole property consisted of two lots, so there was plenty of space, but the cabin itself was dinky. This whole area was in a strange mix between backwoods and suburbia. It was a true neighborhood but not the prim and neatly kept neighborhoods I was used to in suburbia Houston. Despite this, it became a very fun place for me, and some of my greatest memories in life were at that cabin, including my evacuation story from Houston during Hurricane Rita. That is a story for another day. Anyways, around 11 to 12 years old, my father bought me a four-wheeler, and the little late town suddenly became a lot bigger. I didn't go super far, but I definitely ended up going further than I had ever gone before. And it was quite common to see me zipping up and down the roads with a pile of neighborhood kids on the back of the four-wheeler, when we would go up to the lake house on weekend visits. This was around 2001 to 2002, so cell phones were a thing. But it was still common for people not to have them. Usually, I had a beeper that I carried around, but with no phone to the lake house, my father gave me a walkie-talkie with a very long reach instead. 
Looking back on it now from a world of cell phones, this seemed like a bad idea. But this was a small town and we had spent so much time here that it felt safe. So one of these weekends, I was buzzing around my neighborhood like I usually did, and I stopped at this peninsula that overlooked the lake. This was a set of docks that us kids always came to when we wanted to swim, despite the very real threat of giant alligators. But being stupid kids, we really didn't worry about that. And I was overlooking the lake when my walkie-talkie buzzed to life. Naturally thinking it was my parents trying to reach me, I answered quickly. I couldn't quite make out what they said at first, so I tried confirming that it was my dad. At this point in the neighborhood was a little ways away from the cabin, but I had reached my parents from this point before so despite the fact I could not quite recognize the voice, I assumed it was my dad. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary at first. I don't remember exactly how the conversation went, but it was off enough that I remember being slightly annoyed. Garbled questions that I had answered, but no answers that would have hinted at who I was or where I was. Eventually, the conversation started to drift in a way that I knew something was off, but I was not alarmed just yet, as my dad was notorious for pulling pranks on me and goofing around. I kept talking stupidly. Alarm bells weren't going off yet. Finally, though, the guy on the other end of the walkie-talkie makes a comment. I cannot for the life of me remember what he said exactly, but it was enough to make me doubt that it was my father. This is when things took an extremely creepy turn. Bear in mind, I had been talking to this guy pretending to be my father for a good 15 minutes, sitting on my four-wheeler on this peninsula. I can see you. You should come take a ride in my boat, he said. My father had a boat, but this was so out of character that it made me realize that it wasn't my father. Dad, you're not dad, are you? What are you talking about? He said, If you can see me, I started feeling a bit peeved that this guy had been messing with me. What am I wearing? He paused for a second before the walkie crackled to life and he said very clearly, You're wearing an orange shirt. You have red hair and you're sitting on a red four wheeler right by the swim docks. Why don't you come for a ride in my boat? At this point, my eyes widened and my blood ran cold. This entire time, some strange guy that I didn't know had been watching me from God knows where. It took me maybe 10 seconds to look around wildly and then kick the four-wheeler up and race out of there so fast that the wheels had a hard time catching the ground. I remember the wheels spun out against the gravel beneath them, and when the four-wheeler finally started moving, little me had a hard time holding on. I floored it the entire way home, stopped in the middle of the yard and burst into the house. Obviously, the first thing I did was ask my parents if they had contacted me, which they had not and hadn't for hours. I was in such a panic that there is no way my dad wouldn't have convinced had it been him. He was a practical joker, but he knew when the fun was over. I hate to think what might have happened had I continued sticking around the area, or if I hadn't figured out that it wasn't my dad pulling my leg. Nothing came of this incident, though and my childhood up there resumed as normal. Eventually, the weekend visit stopped, but the story doesn't end there. During my parents' divorce, I moved to live at the lake house permanently with my father, or at least until we could find something better. This was the only place that we could go when he left my mother, which is a long story in and of itself, but I won't get into that. My father had recently suffered from health issues, so I took a job at a nearby gas station, a tobacco barn, to pay the bills and let him recuperate. Thankfully, the lake house had no bills save for electricity, water, and internet, so my small salary was enough to keep us going. I only worked there for three months, but those three months were by far the creepiest that I had ever experienced. Within the first month, a rather tall and obese man became infatuated with me, and he couldn't have been creepier. He had a short crew cut hair and a slightly unkept beard and mustache combo. The first time that we ran into each other, he stared at me with his wide, crazy eyes, got his gas and just stood there for two or three solid minutes, just staring. 
When I asked him if I could help him, he said nothing. Now the part of the tobacco barn I worked in was strictly the gas side, and I was pretty much in a glass box with an opening to take people's money and give them their cigarettes, which I could not have been more thankful for. Several times this man came to visit, and he would leave to pump gas after staring at me awkwardly. About the fourth or fifth time, after I thought that he had left, I heard a knock on the other side of the barn on the glass. And there he was, face pressed against the glass, staring at me with this wide, manic grin, and waving at me with his fingers. It was enough to send me running for my manager when he left, demanding to go on break before I peed myself. The last time that I saw him, I will never forget though. It has been etched into my mind so deeply that I doubt Bleach could scrub it away. He arrives as he usually did and orders his gas. This time, however, he reached through the hole in the glass and grabbed my hand before I could put the cash away in the cash register. It wasn't a violent grab, but it was firm enough to keep me from pulling away. Being a very sheltered 18-year-old, I froze in place. I love you, he said, refusing to let go of my hand. I simply stared at him, unnerved at alarm bells ringing in my head. Say it. What? I responded. Say you love me. I... Naturally, I just wanted this guy to go away. And being so freaking scared out of my mind at this point of him, I stammered and I said it out of impulse. Maybe he would let me go and go away. I l love you. I said uneasily. Call me if you need anything. What's my number? He asked again. This threw me off completely. And the look on my face probably gave away my confusion. Because he repeated himself. Despite my stammering that I did not know. Finally. Finally he said something that made my blood run cold. I felt like I was going to throw up. It's 911. He winked. This guy was the sheriff deputy. The person that I would have to call if I got into any sort of trouble in town. The person that I would have to call if I had a medical emergency, or if someone tried to rob me. And he wouldn't let go of my hand. I just nodded, trying to keep myself from shaking bad enough for him to feel it. He had never pulled up in a police car or anything. But when I talked to my manager, she confirmed what he said as being true. Once he did let go of me and went on his way, I retreated to the back and demanded to be relieved from the gas station area. I didn't care. I did not want to see that guy ever again. Thankfully, we moved soon after, so I never had to. But I will never forget the leering grin that man gave me every single time he purchased gasoline. You would think moving away would be the end of the story, but no. It got even worse when I went to college, and you wouldn't think that would be the case considering I was in Galveston. I needed to go to my counselor to discuss a few things, and this usually involved about 30 minutes of chit chat, as me and my counselor had become close while I was attending school. During one of these chats, which my father had attended due to him attending school in the same classes as, it was in an effort to finally get his degree. I mentioned on Alaska, Texas, and how he had owned a lake house up there. Initially, the happy expression left my counselor's face. She informed me that she had been a social worker in that area for quite a few years. And suddenly my childhood playground took an extremely dark turn and the sheriff at the gas station became a nightmare. Apparently that area was notorious for kidnappings and other horrible, horrible incidents. Whole neighborhoods, including police officers, were in on it, and it was common for people trying to out the incidents to either going missing or to be completely thrown out of the community through intimidation tactics. She proceeded to tell me of several cases she had worked on, careful to leave out confidential details, of course, including incidents of entire families being in on the whole mess. And when I told her about the sheriff that I had encountered, she kind of paled and wouldn't tell me anymore, except that she wasn't surprised. The conversation went on for over an hour and a half, but it was enough to make me never want to return to the small town that I had called my childhood summer home.
and vowed to never ever bring any children I might have in the future there. So did the guy that intercepted my walkie-talkie signal and tried to lure me onto his boat. And to the creepy sheriff. Let's never meet again. For the love of God, please. <laughs>